Section 68 of Commentary on the Epistles of Paul the Apostle to the Corinthians, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rachel Clemens. Commentary on the Epistles of Paul the Apostle to the Corinthians, Volume 1, by John Calvin. Translated by Rev. John Pringle. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20-28 through 28. But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that were Christ's at his coming. Then come at the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign, till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, for he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith, All things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. 20. But now hath Christ risen. Having shown what dreadful confusion as to everything would follow, if we were to deny that the dead rise again, he now again assumes as certain what he had sufficiently established previously, that Christ has risen. And he adds that he is the first fruits, by a similitude taken, as it appears, from the ancient ritual of the law. For as in the first fruits the produce of the entire year was consecrated, so the power of Christ's resurrection is extended to all of us, unless you prefer to take it in a more simple way, that in him the first fruit of the resurrection was gathered. I rather prefer, however, to understand the statement in this sense that the rest of the dead will follow him, as the entire harvest does the first fruits, And this is confirmed by the succeeding statement. 21. Since by man came death. The point to be proved is that Christ is the first fruits, and that it was not merely as an individual that he was raised up from the dead. He proves it from contraries, because death is not from nature, but from man's sin. As, therefore, Adam did not die for himself alone, but for us all, it follows that Christ in like manner, who is the antitype, did not rise for himself alone, for he came that he might restore everything that had been ruined in Adam. We must observe, however, the force of the argument, for he does not contend by similitude or by example, but has recourse to opposite causes for the purpose of proving opposite effects. The cause of death is Adam, and we die in him. Hence Christ, whose office it is to restore us to what we lost in Adam, is the cause of life to us, and his resurrection is the groundwork and pledge of ours. And as the former, who was the beginning of death, so as the latter is of life. In the fifth chapter of the Romans, he follows up the same comparison. But there is this difference, that in the same passage, he reasons respecting a spiritual life and death while he treats here the resurrection of the body, which is the first fruit of spiritual life. 23. Everyone in his own order. Here we have an anticipation of a question that might be proposed. If Christ's life, someone might say, draws ours along with it, why does not this appear? Instead of this, while Christ has risen from the grave, we lie rotting there. Paul's answer is that God has appointed another order of things, let us therefore reckon it enough that we now have in Christ the first fruits, and that his coming will be the time of our resurrection. For our life must still be hid with him, because he has not yet appeared. Colossians chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. It would therefore be preposterous to wish to anticipate that day of the revelation of Christ. 24. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered. He put a bridle upon the impatience of men when he forewarned them 
that the fit time for the new life would not be before Christ's coming. But as this world is like a stormy sea in which we are continually tossed, and our condition is so uncertain, or rather is so full of troubles, and there are in all things such sudden changes, this might be apt to trouble weak minds. Hence he now leads them forward to that day, saying that all things will be set in order. Then, therefore, shall come the end, that is, the goal of our course, a quiet harbor, a condition that will no longer be exposed to changes. And he at the same time admonishes us, that the end must be waited for, because it is not befitting that we should be crowned in the middle of the course. In what respect will deliver up the kingdom to the Father, will be explained in a little. When he says, God and the Father, this may be taken in two senses. Either that God the Father is called God and the Father of Christ, or that the name of Father is added by way of explanation. The conjunction et, and, will in the latter case mean namely. As to the former signification, there is nothing either absurd or unusual in the saying that Christ is inferior to God in respect of his human nature. When he shall have abolished all rule, some understand this as referring to the powers that are opposed to Christ himself, for they have an eye to what immediately follows, until he shall have put all his enemies, etc. This clause, however, corresponds with what goes before when he said that Christ would not sooner deliver up the kingdom. Hence there is no reason why we should restrict in such a manner the statement before us. I explain it accordingly in a general way, and understand by it, all powers that are lawful and ordained by God. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. In the first place, what we find in the prophets, Isaiah chapter 13, verse 10, Ezekiel chapter 32, verse 7, as to the darkening of the sun and moon that God alone may shine forth, while it has begun to be fulfilled under the reign of Christ, will nevertheless not be fully accomplished until the last day. But then every height shall be brought low, Luke chapter 3, verse 5, that the glory of God may alone shine forth. Farther, we know that all earthly principalities and honors are connected exclusively with the keeping up of the present life, and, consequently, are a part of the world. Hence it follows that they are temporary. Hence, as the world will have an end, so also will the government and magistracy, and laws and distinctions of ranks, and different orders of dignities, and everything of that nature. There will be no more any distinction between servant and master, between king and peasant, between magistrate and private citizen. Nay more, there will be then an end put to angelic principalities in heaven, and to ministries and superiorities in the church, that God may exercise his power and dominion by himself alone, and not by the hands of men or angels. The angels, it is true, will continue to exist, and they will also retain their distinction. The righteous, too, will shine forth, every one according to the measure of his grace. But the angels will have to resign the dominion, which they now exercise in name and by the commandment of God. Bishops, teachers, and prophets will cease to hold these distinctions, and will resign the office which they now discharge. Rule and authority and power have much the same meaning in this passage, but these three terms are conjoined to bring out the meaning more fully. 25. For he must reign. He proves that the time is not yet come when Christ will deliver up the kingdom to the Father, with the view of showing that the same time that the end has not yet come, when all things will be put into right in a tranquil state. Because Christ has not yet subdued all his enemies, now that must be brought about, because the Father has placed him at his right hand with this understanding, that he is not to resign the authority that he has received until they have been subdued under his power. And this is said for the consolation of the pious, that they may not be impatient on account of the long delay of the resurrection. This statement occurs in Psalm chapter 110, verse 1. Paul, however, may seem to refine upon the word until, beyond the simple and natural meaning of the word requires. For the Spirit does not, in that passage, give intimation of what shall be afterwards, but simply of what must be previously. I answer that Paul does not conclude that Christ will deliver up the kingdom to the Father on the ground of its having been predicted in the psalm, 
but he has made use of this quotation from the psalm for the purpose of proving that the day of delivering up the kingdom has not yet arrived because christ has still to do with his enemies paul however explains in passing what is meant by christ sitting at the right hand of the father when in place of that figurative expression he makes use of the simple word reign the last enemy death we see that there are so many enemies that resist christ and obstinately oppose his reign but death will be the last enemy that will be destroyed hence must christ still be the administrator of his father's kingdom let believers therefore be of good courage and not give up hope until everything that must precede the resurrection be accomplished it is asked however in what sense he affirms that death shall be the last enemy that will be destroyed when it has been already destroyed by christ's death or at least by his resurrection which is the victory over death and the attainment of life i answer that it was destroyed in such a way as to no longer be deadly to believers but not in such a way as to occasion them no uneasiness the spirit of god it is true dwelling in us is life but we still carry about with us a mortal body first peter chapter one verse twenty four the substance of death in us will one day be drained off but it has not been so as yet we are born again of incorruptible seed first peter chapter one verse twenty three but we have not yet arrived at perfection or to sum up the matter briefly in a similitude the sword of death which could penetrate into our very hearts has been blunted it wounds nevertheless still but without any danger for we die but by dying we enter into life in fine as paul teaches elsewhere as to sin romans chapter six verse twelve such must be our view as to death that it dwells inside us but it does not reign twenty seven he hath put all things under his feet some think that this quotation is taken from psalm chapter eight verse seven and i have no objection to this though there would be nothing out of place in reckoning this statement to be an inference that is drawn by paul from the nature of christ's kingdom let us follow however the more generally received opinion paul shows from that psalm that god the father has conferred upon christ the power of all things because it is said thou hast put all things under his feet the words are in themselves plain were it not that there are two difficulties that present themselves first that the prophet speaks here not of christ alone but of the whole human race and secondly that by all things he means only those things that have to do with convenience of the life of the body as we find in genesis chapter two verse nineteen the solution of the former difficulty is easy for as christ is the firstborn of every creature colossians chapter one verse fifteen and the heir of all things hebrews chapter one verse two god the father has not conferred upon the human race the use of all creatures in such a way as to hinder that in the meantime the chief power and so to speak the rightful dominion remain in christ's hands farther we know that adam lost the right that had been conferred upon him so that we can no longer call anything our own for the earth was cursed genesis chapter three verse seventeen and everything it contains it is through christ alone that we recover what has been taken from us it is with propriety therefore that this commendation belongs to christ personally that the father has put all things under his feet inasmuch as we rightfully possess nothing except in him for how shall we become heirs of god if we are not his sons and by whom are we made his sons but by christ the solution of the second difficulty is as follows that the prophet it is true especially mentions fowls of heaven fishes of the sea and beasts of the field because this kind of dominion is visible it is more apparent to the eye but at the same time the general statement reaches much farther to the heavens and the earth and everything that they contain now the subjection must have a correspondence with the character of him who rules that is it has a suitableness to his condition so as to correspond with it now christ does not need animals for food or other creatures for any necessity he rules therefore that all things may be subservient to his glory inasmuch as he adopts us as participants in his dominion the fruit of this openly appears in visible creatures but believers feel in their consciences an inward fruit which as i have said extends farther 
all things put under him except him who put all things under him he insists upon two things first that all things must be brought under subjection to christ before he restores to the father the dominion of the world and secondly that the father has given all things into the hands of his son in such a way as to retain the principal right in his own hands from the former of these it follows that the hour of the last judgment is not yet come from the second that christ is now the medium between us and the father in such a way as to bring us at length to him hence he immediately infers as follows after he shall have subjected all things to him then shall the son subject himself to the father let us wait patiently until christ shall vanquish all his enemies and shall bring us along with himself under the dominion of god that the kingdom of god may in every respect be accomplished in us this statement however is at first view at variance with what we read in various passages of scripture respecting the eternity of christ's kingdom for how will these things correspond of his kingdom there will be no end daniel chapter seven verses fourteen and twenty seven luke chapter one verse thirty three second peter chapter one verse eleven and he himself shall be subjected the solution of this question will open up paul's meaning more clearly in the first place it must be observed that all power was delivered over to christ inasmuch as he was manifested in the flesh it is true that such distinguished majesty would not correspond with a mere man but notwithstanding the father has exalted him in the same nature in which he was abased and has given him a name before which every knee must bow etc philippians chapter two verses nine and ten farther it must be observed that he has been appointed lord and highest king so as to be as it were the father's vicegerent in the government of the world not as he is employed and the father unemployed for how could that be inasmuch as he is the wisdom and counsel of the father is of one essence with him and is therefore himself god but the reason why the scripture testifies that christ now holds dominion over the heaven and the earth in the room of the father is that we may not think that there is any other governor lord protector or judge of the dead and living but may fix our contemplation on him alone we acknowledge it is true god is the ruler but it is in the face of the man christ but christ will then restore the kingdom which he has received that we may cleave wholly to god nor will he in this way resign the kingdom but will transfer it in a manner from his humanity to his glorious divinity because a way of approach will then be opened up from which our infirmity now keeps us back thus then christ will be subjected to the father because the veil being then removed we shall openly behold god reigning in his majesty and christ's humanity will then no longer be interposed to keep us back from a closer view of god twenty eight that god may be all in all will it be so in the devil and wicked men also by no means unless perhaps we choose to take the verb to be as meaning to be known and openly beheld in that case the meaning will be for the present as the devil resists god as wicked men confound and disturb the order which he has established and has endless occasion of offence present themselves to our view it does not distinctly appear that god is all in all but when christ will have executed the judgment which has been committed to him by the father and will have cast down satan and all the wicked the glory of god will be conspicuous in their destruction the same thing may be said also respecting powers that are sacred and lawful in their kind for they in a manner hinder god's being seen aright by us in himself then on the other hand god holding the government of heaven and the earth by himself and without any medium will in that respect be all and will consequently at last be so not only in all persons but also in all creatures this is a pious interpretation and as it corresponds sufficiently well with the apostle's design i willingly embrace it there would however be nothing out of place in understanding it as referring exclusively to believers in whom god has now begun his kingdom and will then perfect it and in such a way that they shall cleave to him wholly both meanings sufficiently refute of themselves the wicked frenzies of some who bring forward this passage and prove of them some imagine that god will be all in all in this respect and all things will vanish and dissolve into nothing paul's words however mean nothing to this that all things will be brought back to god as their alone beginning and end that they may be closely bound to him 
others infer from this that the devil and all wickedness will be saved as if god would not altogether be better known in the devil's destruction than if he were to associate the devil with himself and make him one with himself we see then how impudently mad men of this sort thrust this statement of paul for the maintaining of their blasphemies end of section sixty eight